Wow, Ian. I cannot get enough of that of that 2020 Dream Pop Shoegaze Revival. Can you? Shoegaze Revival, a thing I definitely have heard of. Have you heard of the most awesome reading series of all time during the pandemic? Is it the Segway reading series? So you have heard of it. Yeah. I heard it's pretty amazing. It's pretty great. Do they have any readings today? Um, I think I heard that there were some readings today. Did, did you hear anything? I heard a rumor that Asia would do it and Kate Gabriel were going to do a reading right now. Damn, really? It sounds too good to be true, and yet I believe it is. Thanks for letting me know. I'm very excited. <laughs> um, maybe we should get rolling with it. Yeah. Is there, what do we need to say? Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, I'm Ian. I'm Tasso. And you can't see Sarah O'Connell, but she is uh, the third member of the team bringing you this event. Um, incredibly excited for this reading. I don't think I have much else to add right now. Yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to melt these glaciers. This reading is going to be so hot. <laughs> I think let's get it rolling. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Um, so do you go off screen now and I stay on? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what's, I think that's about to happen, but I'm a little I'm not positive. Cool, cool, cool. So I will um there we go. Thank you. I, I will begin to uh, introduce Asia Wadu, um, who will be reading from her newest collection. No knowledge is complete until it passes through my body. Some more recent poems. I, in my uh, sort of overwhelming joy, or not joy, totally wrong word, but oh, overwhelming belief in the beauty of uh, an earlier book, Syncope, wrote the introduction mainly about this book. Um, but hopefully it will serve uh, some kind of um, bridge to understanding this new work. Uh, so this is my introduction. How might we come to recognize the deaths of others? How might we come to recognize the deaths of others whom we have never met? How might we come to recognize the deaths of others whom we have never met, whose deaths were in part caused by invisible borders constructed and conditioned by the modern nation state? These questions compound further and are felt intimately throughout Asya Wadud's syncope, pictured here, oh. <laughs> which reckons with, recites, chants dirges for, and in Prince language with the passengers on what is called the left to die boat, one of the many maritime vessels which was left to die in what is euphemistically called neutral waters. Wadu challenges with exacting and faithful precision the smoothed over space of international waters, holding off on the lush lyricism common in her other poems, though keeping with a careful attention and experimentation and form to establish a bright and direct poetic channel of testimonial. In an unpublished section of prose, the poet critic translator Ian Dryblatt writes about syncope, it doesn't of course, change anything about the horror these 72 people have experienced. I think what it does is open a contemplative channel to borrow from Wadud's own vocabulary, an alley or isthmus through which we can funnel our own attentions. But this channel is not so simple, nor is it smoothly traversable even in poetry. As I'm realizing already, I have to talk about it using figurative language borrowed from a migratory experience traversable channel, flows of attention, and so on. As much as there is a desirable resonance in the setting of poetics and maritime passage as side by side, there is of course a danger in collapsing the two, which could result in an objectification of human life. Or as Wadud testifies uh, in Syncope, we started to doubt that we were human. Without mirrors, it is impossible to know what we are reflecting, some vastness, our image refract. We doubted our own humanity because the rescue boats, each of them saw something we couldn't see and they shirked us. 
uh, to describe further the light which permeates this text, it is not the light of gardens or of the lamp light of reason, but it's a violent kind of light which disrupts, endangers, distorts, and forecloses the possibility of ever seeing again through a word I first encountered in syncope, photokeratitis, which appears as follows in a eulogizing list. Our bodies begin their descent. One, photokeratitis. Two, an overwhelming listlessness in the knowledge that God forgot us. Three, we forgot our best prayers. Four, our full lips bleeding and creased. This list is one of the many formal mechanisms which Wadud uses to subvert its typical information converting usage into a way of recording instead the very life or experience of the left to die passengers. Because what in part services the turning away of those rescue boats, which um, effectively killed all but nine of the original 72 people on the left to die boat is a reliance on an instrumentalized obscuring capacity of language. Wadud, through ingenuity and infinite courage in writing, the infinitely disastrous, discloses how this instrumentalization registers people as risk, deadweight bodies, and so on, and euphemizes real human death in an attempt to obfuscate its recognition in the hopes of deferring guilt, or as Wadud writes, don't call this a tragedy, you know, in exact language, the ways you exculpate when the violence is stated. Later, the poem reads through the euphemisms and devastating clarity. We are too black, too abject, our yearning too evident, the ugliness of our need. Yet for all of Wadud's incisive meeting up with the truth of absolute disaster and death, for all its attestation, which is beyond poetry or record, there remains a tiny fragment of hope, a futurity without a future. Uh, and I quote again, simply we live with the wreckage. We are the ruin. Meanwhile, we are not ruined. Um, so Asiya Wadud is the author of Crosslight for Young Bird, Day Pulls Down the Sky, a film in gold leaf with Okwi Okpakosali, Syncope, and No Knowledge is Complete Until It Passes Through My Body, the newest book, which is out very recently. Uh, her writing appears in Eflux, Bomb, and Elsewhere. She lives in Brooklyn, where she teaches poetry to children. Please welcome, gratefully and with applauding digital hands, Asya Wadu. Thank you so much. Thanks, Tasso, for that introduction. And thank you, Ia and Sarah. And um, Kay, it's so nice to read with you tonight as well. And um, yeah, just th thank you for those words and the thoughts around them and thinking about a future without a, a future without a futurity, um, which is something that I'm always thinking about. Um, I'm going to read some poems from my new book today, and I'm going to try and read some pieces that I don't usually read, which is just, I don't know, I guess I found my favorites inside the book, or at least the ones I like to read. And so um, I'm going to start by reading um, an essay. Uh, this book was written in, I guess, not necessarily in collaboration, but in thought and in thinking with many different people, um, including Okio Pakwasili, who's a dancer and a choreographer, and uh, thinking with the work of Simone Lee, um, the visual artist, and with the work of Nate Mackey and many others. I'll read some pieces that are kind of in conversation and I feel like this book kept me such good company when I was writing it and I really didn't ever want to let it go. And finally I was just like, okay, fine, I'll let it go. So, or let it do something else at least. So I'll start by reading this essay. It's called Straight Lines, Knots, Quarter Turns, Repeat. Straight lines, a pinprick gets me. The bell of it punctuates the quiet, sharpens the focus by cleaving it. It rings out, directed, exact, its precision, a small resounding hammer. The bell sounds its distant noise, not a matted, muted friction, but a pinprick. It is a single point clarified in crystal. It is the single pin among the many, the pin of my sight line. I see it no matter where I'm standing, no matter how far away. I see it, and then I hear the crisp bell of it. 
I still myself in anticipation of its ringing, let it pass through my body, slide over all of me. I still myself in the moment of its ringing and in, in the immediate aftermath. Because the bell sounds once, I know it can sound again, and I wait for its total ringing. How does the small sound, the little bell of me, shunt us along in a long straight line in all our slippery soft language? The bell clarifies the sound of the straight line, the solitary focused sound of it. All the sounds become the one. A straight line is a system to direct our focus. It is a narrow but generous land bridge, pushing some material along the words charged as they are propelled along in logic, in sound, in fortitude, in soft focus. A straight line builds in a chorus as secretion. It speaks in oblong minor chords, a hint of something I thought I saw a glimmer in the margin. The chords converge, a requisite choir, and now the lines become a billowed volume. Two lines gather at their, at their fine edges, the length and breadth made visible. A pack forms between the edges. We loosely bind the seams to make them aware of one another. Any single line becomes a line of sight, a desire line, and my field of vision fans out into a soft tributary. Meanwhile, a foot presses the firm floor. A hand presses the firm floor. My back on the firm floor. Another foot on the floor. Pressing down, pushing along, aware of how the line has begun to billow. We press forward for new words, a tender line of words, soft focus stills itself to more of the same. And before the words travel, there is the exacting pinprick. The sound doesn't travel, it hovers and rings out. There is nothing itinerant about it. The sound is a payload. Held into the knot long enough, the words slip into a new place. The words eventually slip into a new place, become mere utterances. The words loosen their grip are just outside of focus. Stare at anything too long and this happens. The sameness creates its own charged space, its own song, its everything. The sameness cuts a groove for a new space. It creates an effluence of sameness. Knots. The sound takes its texture, it claims it, it takes all the quality of it and braids it, threads it. It takes its makeup, it takes a shroud to encase it. Once inside the shroud of sound slip further enter the middle of their entanglement. A knot is another kind of a vowel, a covenant of we and language and limb. Take my hands and I will take your hands. We now have our hands, which lets us slip and stitch our words. With our hands like this, we ready ourselves to the base of our language, quarrel and steadfast, or call it a huddle, an acknowledgement that here we are a baseboard, a soundboard, a tender turn. Every hand that is able to grip, grips. All the bells sound in the enclosure of the we. Their sound is a knotted prophylactic. The mess of the sound fills me, slides over, over all of me, creates a film, a steady peace and disturbance. In the huddle, we are knotted limb for limb, we in the knot. The sound takes its texture, it claims it, it takes all the quality of it, and breeds it. Order turns. The 1 p.m. to become itself. First, we have to pass through 12.59 p.m. We do. Inside of it, 60 seconds accrue. Small acts pass inside the seconds. The acts cluster. Second long acts become 10 second acts. And in accordance, the entire minute builds. Sometimes a referent reaches from the present minute to the past building for us an eloquent time bridge. What a tender gesture, the small allotment. Seconds build to minutes and the accumulated time slips softly from minute to minute. Many small acts that have passed within the quarter hour, that small turn of phrasal language, what a low gliding hum. Four quarter, four quarter turns equal full rotation. Repeat, the pen prick gets me, it got me. What a prismatic longing, what a covenant to speak to the bloom, what bell, little tangle, what salvage that made us. There is a room, there is an open door, call it invitational, remove the door from the hinges and call it a room that we all fill. There is a low hum at the baseboard, the language just on the other side of the door is one that you know, you speak it and it rests inside of you. 
That was a language mix, so that the term in straight lines mixed with knotted ones, mixed with quarter turns, all our rightfully sliding language. The bell looks for a clean sound, one for all of us. It rings once, and it may well ring again, so we hold for it. Meanwhile, we are knotted. Meanwhile, there is our rotation in words and gestures. We are knotted and tangled. We are, we are shrouded, pressing on. Um, I know I said I was only gonna read pieces I don't usually read, but there is one poem I do like to read from this book. And even though I often read it these days, I'm gonna read it one more time today. It's called L. And it's written in conversation with a poem by um, Claire Womanholm, and her poem is called O. L. Long live our loyalty, how it loops, falls, lumbers, lulls, and lists, finally resisting its own limpness. Long live anything that has long wished to live, the lasso, the lake, the limit, the left lane, the spices spinning on their lazy Susan. The lavender field at peak bloom, illustrious and oven hot, land and the outliers, land and the legion of the outer banks, latitude and that was my limit until I looked left, what length we expect to cover in these longitudinal years, building loops slice lengthwise to see their insides. The latent exercise of the loom, left to right, layered weft and warp, listening to its language leached all across the living room. An antecedent to loyalty is drift, drift, or look away from the limit. Let me look at the warp shapes inside the lava, angry loaves lifting the mouth of the mountain, then lifting clear off the mountain. Leavened loaves at the limit of their leavening. Left loaves, rock hard obsidian thoughts make. My yearling, even luxury has its limits, having lived or existed all year long. Love is a lifetime of long live our loyalty, what loops, falls, lumbers, lulls, and lists, finally resisting its own limpness, a lifeline or ulna, all my limber bones held in my left hand. I place the bones on a bay laurel leaf, place the wreath inside a barrel, lined up the barrel alongside other barrels laden with laurels and ulnas. What to say of lavishing honor, what to say of laconic I once tried, what of leisure or lassitude? Not all pines loosen at the ends of their branches, languishing before they fall, loop through the extra air. I am alone in the lake region, algae bloom at my ankles, loaves lifting the mountain to make fresh archipelagos. Thank you. Thanks. That's nice. <laughs> Okay, okay. Um, okay, here's one that I never read. And is um, let's call it first day one. Take the table, take the book. Take the cup, the object animated, the object mute. Don't drop it, be it cylindrical, oblong, in a hurry, quiet. Place it next to your body and then notice every body in space. Every body's itinerant object and ownership may always be tenuous. Train your silence to fill the space. Your even breathing, switch back if your eyes and your tongue will let you. Move with them and move in them, then move with them and move the table by fortitude, by forfeiture, or by carrying it. Think of it as one large plane made manifest in which anything can become whatever. Set the glass there and it leaves its day long water ring, halo, O, marking object, obscene what it needs to leave, but don't drop it. Don't drop it. Mute magic, fissured moment, tangle island. I need the cloth to ferry the hour. The cloaked minutes become their own resolute tables, sliding everything against or at each other. 
know your body, know the distance, what have you, the brick black, whatever, before everything continues, slides, nearly collapses. This is day one, or this is day one, and this is day one. I'm willing to use my feet. I'm willing to try for extension. Ask, ask for it, now extend. Now take the object, take your two hands, take the book. Don't drop it. Use your eyes. Triangulate movement. Find focus. Fix features. Use your hands if you are able. Take the cup or book, backpack, container, horizontal arrangement, fragrant bouquet. Take it. Take it all and then place it at the center of our table. We know your name, our eyes said. We know your name, our mouths said. We know your name, our eyes said. Assume your goodness. Our feet bear the burden in the atrium as we approach the table and again as we disperse. In our lives, we can notice a breath when breathing. Thank you. Um, okay. We set them out across the channel. The windows were a clean compass, our loving instrument due north, and the exit was so narrow that was a way to direct our focus. When we got north, we found the hollow, and when we found the hollow, we didn't lament. It was a matter of expectation that we would need to examine the blueprint with precision and then we'd scrap it. We gouged and cradled a monk's rest. I mean, together, we decided to cobble something wrought from what we had in plenitude, what we had in common, narrow alabaster, a throughway, a glove. We weren't scared. The night came with everything it envelops, the moon readily exerted. The tide grew. We took shelter where we could, really just inside each other. We each held each other just long enough to imprint narrow alabaster, warbler glove. We considered the northern wheat ear, stayed in its sight line, knew when its wings folded, it was time for us to crest too. Transmigratory or just the everyday diasporic, pedestrian in the fact that we now have to name this. The hollow was electric in its sameness, in the fact that each turn elicited something newly hewn. The metric was, what can we call for us, and what has transmuted for too long that it didn't find its way home. On Wednesday, we made paper cranes. We set them out across the channel. They were a bit cautious, and they were lovely in their fates. And when we found nothing, we didn't lament. It was a matter of expectation that we would need to examine the blueprint before we could ever ingest it. We put on the market a detached single family home. Every room held a border and every wall there was a holding pattern. In the broader rooms we held each other right before we set ourselves out across the fissured channel. I left the warbler's room. I left the warbler's door ajar. I knew I'd need to peer in, a little mystic guiding us in all its teeming imminence. And I think I'm going to read, um, I'm going to read one more. And um, thank you so much one more time. Thanks for being here today. Okay. The back door of the Lone Coast. Abnegation began in December, something to do with the raw nature of endings, to do with the sailing clarity or finish. Abnegation or I can have it both ways is in part credence, part self swayed. The heart line of my left palm extends to receive whatever it is you place in it, or that it will be sustenance because I have known how it is to be fed. 
abdication or the act of annexing another country or the act of falling deeper into the hole of the purported days, the act that act as some extension. I made a charcoal line in the wet cement while it was being laid, stuck a few pebbles in the corner as the cement set. Knew each time I saw the pebbled surface, I would be reminded of the moment when I placed the pebbles in the pavement of the wet cement. I'm always half here, moving the bouquet across the house. Let its little shuddering petals fill me. Hold the neck of the vase. Don't dare let it slip. Abnegation began in December, something to do with self-made endings. Chlorophyll in the winter is a commitment, but possible. Train the pathos towards the sun so that it can also grow. Might as well let it grow if you plan to let the plants live. I cannot be burdened. I cannot burden you with this kind of abnegation. So instead took to the bed, stayed there all night, slept for eight hours of it, woke up on a Saturday. My head leaked the message, everything set to orchestra pitch. The radio reminded me that if I could commit, I could do it my way. Place my foot in the black asphalt, take my foot to the cement for clearance. The cooler weather began in December. I didn't notice when the cloud coverage ended. My eyes were trained on the ground, and since I trained them, I saw the phalanx of my winter shelter. In the night, I sweat out all the abject days or humiliation. The ceiling fell around me, and I belatedly sought shelter under the desk. I asked my sister to join me, and I awoke at the threshold. Snow banter of drywall, dreamlike in this way. I awoke at the threshold, all cleave and cleft. Abnegation is a foolish lean lake slipping into a logic of threefold and deliverance. The whole marks its own shape. Abnegation is an aseptic aqua lake. I have seen this kind of water, all stylized and brute, all shelter shorn and brute, all gradient all becoming. I have seen this kind of water leaks out to life, something like a crosshatch. But I think he said we are only made by giving away what humble placeholders we are given. And what we are given was cultivated in a garden, Arkansas crosshatch. Cane crawl down the corridor, faith talk and more, or iron ore and oxidation. I have tried to board a flight, bird life in furcula, wishing in my documents, night train in terror, compartments or gardens. I have tried to board a flight. I succeeded 78 times. Stamp mark my entry, foul language my exit. But anyways means nothing to me, barely matches my imprint. I retreat to the garden, let its language provide the slippage, let its countervalence get more vivid, let to let, to let to lean. Between Christina Sharp and Tokase Dyson, what kind of space would you need to move 500 people quickly? I have used the blueprint as a maritime future, used it as a seafaring fold. All foul futures never rest, blueprint I'll show you I'll show the magistrate and expect to claim what is mine or at least clarify what I meant. I thought to ask permission or just erase the door from the back entrance, room to room to room to green finish, vaunted ceilings and picture windows, a vacuum or comfort in the cavity, comforted by the room and oiled all the birch doors, abnegation or the lone coast, the back door or the lone coast, clarify what I meant or the lone coast. Thank you. Thank you. I always feel like the spotlight comes on me when I look like a fool clapping, but that's great. I would love to celebrate Asya's writing by looking like a fool any day. Thank you so much for your reading. It's, it's really wonderful to hear um, you read it. I feel like your, your poems are set in the book so carefully, but then, then you're reading it is like a different kind of setting up carefully and the two are different, but crossover. I mean, okay, thank you. Uh, we are gonna listen to another song, pop up the donation uh, sign for about five minutes. So grab your favorite snack or beverage, do whatever you gotta do. 
and uh, we'll be back for Ian Dryblatt to introduce K Gabriel, which you should not miss if you are smart. So stay tuned. Hello. That was amazing. Uh, yeah. that, I really enjoyed that. Uh, and Asia, thank you so much for that reading, which was uh, uh, such a privilege to hear it. Um, really wonderful. I, I uh, yeah, I'm such an admirer of Asia's writing. And we just learned at the start of this reading that Asia will be taking over cur curation of this very segue reading slot beginning in, in 2022, which uh, couldn't be nicer news to hear. I, I think that that's, uh, I'm really excited to see what happens with that. I, uh, I like that it's kind of like a full, we're, we're setting up for a full circle here. Ending, we're ending, but others are not ending. Others are in fact beginning. That's true. And we're not ending yet. Uh, we're having a reading next week with uh, Galina Rimbu, who'll be reading uh, through some translators, and Wendy Trevino. That, that is going to be fantastic. Uh, if you didn't throw your $5 in the virtual hat just now, please do so. You can do it on Venmo or PayPal, and that information will be back up on your screen again uh, at the end of the reading. So you can do it. The money goes directly to the readers. Um, yeah. And I think with that, I'm going to introduce Kay. Is there more that we should? Um, no, I think I'm going to uh, introduce Kay. OK, but then I have to use my computer. Oh, no. Wait, what did I do? Here we go. Um, OK, sorry. Uh, one of the first things I really noticed about Kay Gabriel was her use of the word enjoy at poetry readings. I feel like after a reading, you usually hear people say one of a few things. That was great. I'd love to see that on the page, the all-purpose wow. But time after time, I would hear Kay frame her experience of a reading in terms of enjoyment. I really enjoyed that, or maybe some critique followed by, but I still enjoyed myself. There is a kind of offhand critical clarity about this, an insistent focus on what is, after all, one of the absolute best things about art that I was really struck by. Kay's work often feels like a riotous celebration of the intelligence we hardly understand in ourselves. It is marked besides its scholarliness and political vibrancy by the joyful, unrestrained cadences of improvised speech, the music of actual thought. There's a sonnet Kay wrote to Kevin Killian after his death, calling as well on Warhol superstar Candy Darling, for and about whom Kay has written sonnets. I wanted to excerpt it, excerpt it for this intro, but the whole thing has such a powerful sense of rhythm in the words original sense, the form or shape in which it flows that I can't take anything out. So with, I hope, Kay's and everybody's indulgence, I'm gonna read the whole thing. Uh, Salute to private language, diagnoses, blondes collected to Candy's platinum arms. In a private language, I discovered, do I like Bataille or do I like like Bataille? Does Bataille like like me? Does Kevin like like Kylie? Nobody will learn until a volume of your collected works cracks open to elegy or dance moves on a misadventurous floor, swinging my bag. In a private language, I told you wow, and you said wow, 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 and everybody else administered an additional wow until it was time, please, to say it again. When I say that I find it impossible to extract any line or passage from this poem, I think I am in part observing some of Kay's connection to the ancient writers on whom she, a doctor of classics, is an authority. I've just read you the second of Kay's two sonnets without an H for Kevin Killian, which if it has some Ulipian overtones feels to me more closely connected to Catullus's 84th poem, which devastatingly deflates a dude named Arius for pretentiously pronouncing all of his H's. In Greek, no letter but a diacritical wobble it tells you to puff, she notes in the earlier one. And then talking to Kevin seems to turn to their shared K, our common initial good in small like one or two doses, but okay, I'd take it again. It's not just Kay's attention to the letter H that reminds me of Catullus or the interpresence of philology, intimate reflection, unenclosable joy, and political commitment. It's the way a lot of her poems feel sort of like hyper-alive meanders through the vital intrinsicness of what constitutes them. Like Catullus or like Bernadette Mayer, her work puts us in the closeness of a mind so distinctive it feels elemental, writing waves of fully immediate language. 
Kay's work as a critic and anthologist has also proved invaluable. Her reviews of books like Andrea Lawler's Paul Takes the Form of a Mortal Girl for The Believer and Andrea Long Chu's Females for the LARB are trenchant, edifying, forceful, and deeply enjoyable models of the form. We Want It All, the anthology of radical trans poetics that Kay co-edited with Andrea Abi Karam, published by Nightboat last year, is currently a finalist for the Lambda Award for LGBTQ Anthology. Speaking about it, Kay has said, quote, part of what we wanted to do was in fact to carve out a space for the really frank declaration or narrative of desire, adding that there, quote, absolutely is a moralism within literature right now about trans bodies touching other bodies, seeking to transcend a passivity that is about being the object of other people's activity. Kay borrows a term from Raymond Williams in returning to poetry's, quote, capacity to produce a certain structure of feeling, emphasizing how it can make you feel like you are experiencing and witnessing and creating abundance or recognizing an abundance that had, com that had been completely misrecognized. Essential to the kind of radical scholarship K practices, I think, is that the revolutionary politics that anthology engages are not an object of removed contemplation, indeed, not just the object of her own scholarly activity, but an exemplary political commitment in her life. As editor of the Poetry Project newsletter, Kay wrote from Abolition Park, previously known as New York City Hall Park, last summer to raise, quote, the question of the relation between poetry and the street, between what's going on and the forms of thought and language that can make it perceptible in its totality. A crucial interrogation if many of us are to make good on the ethical stakes of our own work, and one in which Kay has continued to work productively, facilitating discussions on poetry and prison abolition, incorporating ethical considerations by other poets into her own work, reliably declining to shy away from the crucial challenges of gathering human beings into a makeshift counterpolis. There's so much more I'd like to talk about. Her engagement with the epistolary, which she has written extensively in and called the poetic genre of mediated intimacy. Her last lines, which make escapes worthy of bank robbers heaven. But I'm running low on time, so I will just say that Kay Gabriel has two books forthcoming right now, Kissing Other People or The House of Fame coming this year from Rosa Press and A Queen in Bucks County coming next year from Night Boat. Root for We Want It All to win the Lammy on June 1st, and please stand up right now in your home and go apeshit to welcome the one and only Kay Gabriel. Oh my goodness, Ian. Um, I'm a pat of butter right now. Thank you. Um, what can I say? Uh, I, I, I do want to say thank you to you and Taza for inviting me. I want to say uh, thank you to um, uh, Asia for, for sharing the stage. Um, it's a pleasure to hear your work and uh, like always. Um, and I was thinking in connection with what I'm gonna read, I heard some poems that were written in the first person plural, which I, is a voice that I like really associate with um, Mu and Song of the Andombalu and like not necessarily, but like that's such a, it's such a difficult one to write in, um, to, to have many lines or sentences saying we. Um, and it was a challenge that I set myself in the thing I'm gonna to read today. Um, uh, so I, that's an interesting point of uh, contact. Um, I, I'm going to read from neither of the books that I have forthcoming, um, although I like them. Um, but I, I, I'm going to read from a poem I am writing now. It's called Perverts. Um, it has the following premise. Uh, I am writing, so, so Kissing Other People or the House of Fame is, which is a book that um, my friends Astrid and Andrew, who have the new uh, press, Rosa Press, Rosa After. Luxembourg, because why not? Um, uh, 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 they are releasing this book this uh, later. I think it's coming out this summer. Um, they're typesetting it now. It's very exciting. And um, the premise for that, the title poem of that book is um, that it's a poem written out of a year of my dream journals. And so in this poem that I'm going to, in perverts, this poem I'm going to read, I um, am kind of varying that effect by writing through my dream journals and also the dream journals of my friends. And at this point, I will make the invitation that I frequently make when I read this poem. And so far, nobody has taken me up on it, but it's meant in earnest, which is that if you want to send me, if you write down your dreams, if you're someone who has this perversion, um, and if you also do this weird thing, um, or if you want to start doing this weird thing, um, and you want to send me 
your recorded dreams. I will write them into this poem eventually. Um, so that is an open and genuine and honest invitation. And it's maybe kind of a dare because I'm curious if someone at this point will actually take me up on it. Who knows? Um, okay. Perverts. We developed a program of eliminating other people's eyelashes. First, we did it by accident, as in I burned my own off while trying to sleep. Then we did it for justice, then for vigilante revenge. Open the doors of perception, we said, approaching strangers and taking their eyelashes. It's Byronesque. Only in the dream, we said to Byronic. Christian, my conspiratorial eyelash thief, has not yet sent me his dreams. Christian, this is where your dreams will go in this canto of an epic poem stitched together from the dreams of lovers, possible or actual, spit subjects of the dream parliament. Who writes an epic poem in 2019? Perverts. I started this like three months ago. Luckily, I'll quit after some pages. I backdated the poem to obviate my reckless, poor, and still unshamed decisions. Reckless, I sort through my revolutionary grammar. I do it in two big bins. One is for always repeating myself. One is for getting in trouble if I do it poorly. Then I've gone to visit my mom in the Arctic, although it's December, there isn't any ice. She's on a boat docked in harbor. Periodically, she leads marches on the mainland, rocking the settlers off the balls of their feet. Neither of us is well liked. I walk around in the sun, stupefied. Blonde mothers and children and some have returned to the water. Fuck. A dead-to-me friend entered the dream with an unfinished collaboration from the period of our love, covered in dots over the page, covered too in fond, taunting expressions. I read them in smarts of pain and reproduce imperfectly Waxahachie's fire. I haven't spat on anyone in a dream. I thought by force of will I could prompt a dream about spitting, but instead Victoria and I had our photos taken in matching hats. We were supposed to look like celebrities. Uh, somewhere in a sterile with cold light after arguing all night and accidentally putting on garments from an infamous sweatshop under the Williamsburg Bridge. I wake in the confidence will make the appropriate re recompense payments coming due on bad decisions, recklessly making out and writing about it on the wrong side of the day. Reckless, I guess, the word for public health decisions a lover makes about his body conjunct mine, according to his roommates and his Tinder crush. I could litanize the shit I know. My questionable choices and getting rod on that occasion would make the cut only because it happened indiscreetly on a half inflated blow up bed. He shot my mouth. Still fuck fate and villainy. I remember vividly the sore throat a doctor insisted had to be the clap and which friend was falsely informed in case of a fever that he must have been Sarah converting. I forget, so we get to talking pills and diagnoses. Mike's been skimming off my melatonin. I left at his house and Stephen asked Mike if, he, if Mike had any tea he could park with. I said, I don't know, but I do. Christian and his medical grade ketamine, I called my chemical blanket. Munya, who couldn't drink after her well butrin, but did anyway. And Allison, who hated her antipsychotics to extreme consequence. B, who rearranged her life for a sympathetic Ativan. And Blake, who passes off his clone like juicy fruits. Mid-crisis of someone's hospitalization gave me 10 in a bottle like a secret or present of sleep. Money, who bagged her oxy and threw it in the trash. Bryn, who blogged ardently about no longer taking a tripla. And Connie, who pushes her Adderall for other people's parties. Mike uses it for work. The people's Lexapro, Prep, Propraniol, Estradiol, Valisliclovir. I'll leave some for yours in this combination epic poem Rx sheet. And there's a couple of lines left on the page. Yours, the Dr. Perverts. In a world in which a pervert's as good as the doctor, as fastidious, as gnarly, as intrusive in attention, a D's on prezosin, a drug I used to take for ni excess nightmares, its effects discovered from double-blind trials on U.S. soldiers returned from Iraq and Afghanistan. Mine made me faint in Colorado, and a D says it traps them in the ghoulish folds of sleep. Now Austin's dreaming B-movie horror shots, a bird man in a plague mask walks with a cane slowly under a street bin and fucking charges at the camera, that's a quote. On another night, blob men lure you into a no-exit cult. I'd be entertained to appear as the final girl of someone else's slasher dreams, but I guess only the dreamer gets out alive, and then only in the role of the camera. Later, I dream of three oversexed teen vampires, real teenagers who grew unchanged, not just Edward Cullen teenagers. I'm one of them, a boy vampire, older brother, younger sister. Our mom, who we live with on a stage exposed to the rain, loves to trot us out in front of strangers as an example of truly proficient talent. It's vampire Stephen Sondheim's vampire gypsy. 
One of her friends says she has permission to come and film us while we wake naked from our vamping incest orgy. So I say I'd rather be blinded than filmed. I mean, hardly, but indulge me. I demonstrate my preference by temporarily blinding all three of them and restoring their eyesight. My brother, who is also my lover, says, no, not fair. I'll blind you. You price your point. And so he claws at our eyes and restores our sight by encanting that it's all fine now. All that remains of the blinding is some black pus-like gore, but still I say, see, that was horrible. Since so my cinematic dreams are all teen monster dramas, while Austin dreams a video game like War, his brother and father discover a laptop detailing a nuclear bombing of a Radiohead concert in the Navy. Japanese biplanes force a mass dive into the water while other divers offer keys to strangers, but instead try to stab them, slicing open Austin's foot. Then he steals a jet ski and shows a blade to work. Joe is in a stop and shop. They're searching for tea up and down the aisles. They find coffee and chocolate, Pop-Tarts, Cliff Bars, but no tea, and run into their old manager, Jerome. He gives them a hug and makes fun of their mullet, talks to them about the new bosses. Suddenly, Joe's starring in a procedural. Who would I play in a procedural? Probably a bluish corpse with smoker's lines and clues under her chipped nails. It would launch me into a fabulous career of B-list cameos, the trans amic. Joe, I love your mullet, though I do a lot before growing on myself. I'd rather be a district manager. Wow, kidding. Dear Cam, I fell asleep in the bath believing falsely you had sent me dreams to record while Austin examined my body for faults and scars. Cam, my frequently gone at your sea, the more rarely the subject of my dreams, uh, uh, the more rarely the subject of my dreams is you tread water in my waking thoughts. I dream about you with unaccustomed pleasure like the time Harry Styles' car broke down and he surprised his super fan. I think of his hot, infantile, but receding hairline plastered with sweat over the hood, the fan coming home to an unreal pop icon in engine grease, an AO3 setup for the meat cute of a gender swap Notting Hill, only your appeal is more like a cuter Ian Mackay or a living Ian Curtis. I watched a half hour documentary with footage of a teenage youth thrashing Winnipeg basements and dreamt of a school of ragtag forgetful goth characters like everyone you know in Wednesday Adams Drag. We're setting up to go to bed, but I've decided on everyone sleeping in my room, which just kind of expands forever. All kinds of elevated surfaces and chairs, chaise long sofa bed. I'm on a surprisingly comfortable pad on the floor. Violet badly wants to sleep in the same bed. Jules is present. Kiki, I have sequenced the genome of dyke drama in this dream of surfaces. Something snaps in the mirror world or someone feeds something into a mirror they shouldn't. Now we all have to evacuate quickly, removing all evidence of ourselves. As we huddle out into the cold part of the story, I turn paper into dust rather than make the mistake twice with the mirror. But then I can't find which black mask is mine. As Jules dreams of not of linear beds of lovers, but of water coming out milky, quote, I thought we should stop paying rent. And the cops watch from a window outside while they sleep with Kay. Not me, I think. Different character, same taunting initial. Without scruples, I admit to taunting the vacant hard up reader of the dream. I'll taunt you from the back of a busted car. I'll taunt you from the fucking moon. You'll fucking love it off the floor, onto the off the chair, onto the writhing floor as we collectively discover how ethics are made of lava. Just as in another dream, Jules was driven uptown to a hotel while Hannah poured wine in her mouth. A different transsexual poet memoirist, menacing crush and ketamine enthusiast. Oh, is that mean? I'm just observing patterns like the waltz of cruelly sculptural women across someone else's field of hot vision. I'd like to know my own appeal. Acker compared the taste of her cunt to the syrup lining the wafers of Hydrox biscuits. I think mine is more like tangerine skins or the bruise on gently fermenting peaches or assy wine. The driver leaves Jules on purpose. They're swimming with Hannah. It's a race. They lose the goggles and return to the dream hotel. The lobby insists on correctly gendering the goggles owner that this requires a choice between Mr. and Mrs. Possessor. Jules wins out in the end, texting that they got the goggles back for the angry workers. Then on December the 4th, I dreamt I was hospitalized at a clinic, but I break out of it, sliding onto a cold landscape in other people's yards and land. It's a Betty Ford clinic, only it's in Vermont. I can tell because of the snow and pine needles and because everything is cut into triangles. There are deer, but they are secret. The hill I'm sliding down requires secret deer language, and its owner, a friendly older white man, comes home, but I don't trust him. Instead, I run and hide in a copse and write a note that later I struggle to decipher, but it has to do with the snow and sanctity of deer language, how you cannot use it to build or slide down your triangular hill in the dark. I know so little about Vermont, I can't possibly be protective of it, as if I've swapped places with Connie, who dreams of New York Yiddishkeit. Setting, the Bronx, a cafe, a factory, and lecture hall. 
Her acquaintance, or more precisely co-star or addressee, had traveled to New York for archival research. The two walked through an unevenly gentrifying and historically immigrant neighborhood, like where Connie's grandfather moved from Poland before the Shoah. Stop in a cafe of Yiddish speakers drinking hot sweet teas and clear liquors, basically paint thinner, in tiny glasses. The addressee of the dream tried to make contact with a labor organizer who under threat of surveillance only reluctantly allowed Connie her and her dream companion access to the archives where their family history was stashed. A guarded file in the union hall, old and crowded with shells of loose documents. In the dream, Connie could read Yiddish, so she cried. The two leave the lecture hall talking about like socialism or unions or something. My grandfather too briefly was a so my grandfather too briefly was a socialist architect before he left apartheid South Africa, moved to Montreal, and designed shopping center shopping plazas and sometimes homes. On December the 5th, I dream of a march that proceeded slowly to a house both in Ridgewood and in Ottawa. It's my grandfather's house, it's the object of a protest. We're walking up Decatur to 60th Lane and feel assured of our eventual success. Inside it's orange, large, and slightly medieval. I could call my grandpa now to ask about his health, and he'd talk about Zero Mastel, who picked up Dick Cavett and waltzed in the length of his own stage like puppetry's special goy. But I wouldn't learn his temperature or the state of his cough. Mike dreams of a band named My Chemical Abortion. Then posting on social media, asking crushes to reveal themselves, but only his coworkers responded at the job he's trying to quit. Then he was living in the woods. Once Mike dreamt he was walking himself on a leash. Did I get that right? Waking up, I told you my head felt like a black velvet bag. What's in the bag, you asked? Nothing, I said first, then monopoly money or counterfeit money, and finally, crimes. Rosario once had a night terror sleeping beside her former lover now moved to Boston and gone stealth. I shouldn't laugh about it, but I do. The lover sitting astride her pelvis became Luca Brasi from The Godfather and choked her awake. I'm no night terrorist. I'm a fake Catherine, like Diane Keaton in The Godfather, a charming, glamorous Kay married to a wayward, short, hot Mike. Now who's naive, he's asking in of all places, dull New Hampshire. All of my outfits in part two, that exquisite coat I'm wearing. Do you guys remember this? Like she looks so bad in part one. Dan Keaton does. It's, it's, it's really, it's offensive. But, but, but so good in the next movie. All of my outfits in part two, that exquisite coat I'm wearing when Al Pacino slams the door in my face. Make up for the wigs they made me wear in part one where some of the Italians are actually Jews like James Caan. On December 18th, I dreamt of running with my sister Taryn down escalator steps away from a man attempting to hypnotize us with his phone screen. A villainous creature like a cartoon Dracula, he wanted to break into our underground home. We outsmart him vaulting down subway steps past the toll booth in The Godfather where Sonny's assassinated. I'm definitely naive. Senators kill people, so do presidents and Democrats. I'm an intense waif, nay Adams. I'm God and this is my husband, Michael. Warren Beatty cast me in reds as I bundle the Corleone kids in the back seat and steal away from the 50s. I tease Roe for liking Jewish women. I ask her when she's going to convert, but she says that that would ruin the fun in being the shiksa, which is to say in dating us. Rachel didn't care for The Godfather, which she says was mostly about men, and it's true, maybe except Talia Shire, whose minor and complicated history balances loyalty to husband, father, brothers while hating Al Pacino's pl implacable guts. But I'm fixated on the recent history tragedy of Europeans who became white, and I don't mind the movie's homosocial exchanges of death, fruit, favors, and crimes. I like men and villains. I like the romance of kissing your brother on the eve of the Cuban Revolution. Christian, I lied, your dreams go here. Once you dreamt that an unfamiliar coworker was giving out spray bottles of what you assumed to be weed. Your chef encouraged you to take one and asked you if you ever go shooting and you said yes when you play basketball. Later, you ran down a small town street chased by young boys taunting you. When you tackled them, you spoke with one who said his sister was Mary Shelley, but she wasn't famous yet. The evidence being that her brother didn't yet know Frankenstein. He sent me this dream and I nearly replied, oh, you tackled Percy. Think about it. I stopped myself, but Stephen says in the Shelley's letter, they call each other brother and sister, so I guess you kind of did. Quote, contemplating hell, Brecht says, my brother Shelley supposed it would mostly resemble London, as Brecht thought it would be like LA, where the fructifying trees die without expensive water. The brothers Brecht and Percy kiss on New Year's. They join the revelers in the former, former banks they surely would. Now I'm your twin, but I haven't ridden Frankenstein, sunk into the mud at the Villa Diodati, or miscarried or done anything of note. I'm 17 or 27. I dream of wearing a harness and asking to be hooked to something. Nobody's listening. I say hooked 
hooked, but you don't understand. Soon after, I dream I'm lying rather innocently on your lap, and you're flicking hair off my face, strand by brotherly strand. Then you dream your parents throw you a surprise birthday party in a movie theater. The movie theater's in a mansion. It's your new home. In this dream of possession, it has a jacuzzi, all the comforts of an obscene life. All the lots of people come to your parent thrown birthday party, but the dream ends before anything screens. Too bad. Really, I'm curious what career creations you could have produced. A serious man screening underground in your haunted Bethesda McMansion? Your parents embarrass you by inviting your friend to this unmoved movie in the burbs. I guess nothing, not even expiation, will solve the age-old problem of anarchists with family wealth, like Shelley, Pasadena, Suffolk County, and nominee Fugazi. I forgive, my, forgive myself a different class aspiration to become the trans David Rakoff. Kidding. Often in dreams, I'm a boy or an old woman. Oh, I'm going to skip a bit. On January 19th, I dream of swimming in a polluted canal a river called the Say, which is and is not the Gowanus Canal, connecting both sides of the colonial border. I was and was not in a mob. I definitely had a boss with fat cheeks, sat in a nylon folding chair, and I also dreamt about purges. I was a delegate in the National Assembly in 1789. Our meetings took place in a pool. I lined up brightly colored straws and plastic rhinoceros toys as the blatant symbols of caucus maneuvers. In the bourgeois, I, in the dream, I was on acid and a very strong swimmer. In the bourgeois pool that covered many rooms, I find a teenage trans street artist we make out selfishly. In the dreams, I'm a little gayer than in waking life, often in water surprisingly toppy, though I never did finish lining up the straws. So what would you do as a parish priest in the 1780s in protest over the salt tax? A scruffy Jacques Roux bound to himself dreams of property as an athletic lover. Patrick, you dreamt of the CUNY library on fire. You dove in heroically to save Stalin's copy of Capital, although it seems pretty certain that he never even read it. Still, Ruthie arrives to congratulate you for doing the right thing. Then in the same week, you dreamt of a mass meeting of the left, an old school gymnasium or auditorium. I'm editorializing here, but I can see this combination general assembly or historical materialism gathering. White walls, movement egos, everyone sitting on their floor in their million debates. David Harvey in his 80s addressing the assembly says something finally that gets him canceled. A chorus of hundreds shouts and exits the dream, but you'd been given a job as his minder. The unenviable task falls to you of explaining the debacles to the confused and sad Harvey. He doesn't fully understand why or how he fucked up. Then you took him back to the house you were renting together, comforted him and put him to bed, logged onto Grinder and got caught mid fuck on the veranda with your app hookup, though not by David himself. I'd pay good money to see the caucus theater, the burning library, Stalin's unread marks. Once you starred in a slightly too cinematic dream I had in which a bearded Trudeau Jr. We all know who Trudeau, Trudeau is, right? Yes. Yes, um, a, a motherfucker, so I hear. In which a bearded Trudeau Jr. arranged an end of history maneuver for Ottawa to be secretly populated by robots. They moved with precision through different parts of the city. He hoped nobody would notice and maybe nobody would have without Patrick your role in the dream. You hack the robots such they stop moving and start shouting horrible shouts, making such a tremendous noise they upend the peaceable and frankly boring capital where nothing moves except speculation at the speed of hoisting bitumen out of the ground and where you and I were both born. Now it's a place of total noise and chaos, shouting robot shouts, a noise show in a barn somewhere made public like a social wage. Cam has a Mertzbo shirt from a show that caused him nerve damage. I like to wear it and pretend I'm the boyfriend. A punching bag for Tyrannosaurus sound waves, though really I protect my delicate ears. Patrick, I'm a sap for pretty shit. Brecht and Artaud make beauty suspect as it should be, and that's their real point of contact. Now my broken doorbell is hissing at the mouth like a robot in Trudeau Jr.'s House of Commons, or a parish priest urging arms over the salt tax. Ottawa has shed its clothes of bureaucratic perfection. In the dream, the shouting robots allowed something to unlock elsewhere, since Ottawa, here and always a city of squares, was consumed by its forever droning puppets and nobody died. And nobody died. Optimism. Well, I think that's funny. I'm being dialectical so you don't have to. I lived with a guy who said, it won't be a good revolution if I survive it, fighting the people's war in Patterson, New Jersey. Crisis escalated me out of that place and into the expensive hovel near the Home Depot with the roaches and the infuriating smell. The one long-lasting roommate, an aging beauty, and a spy for the landlord. Remember how I lived with Stephen and Liam for a month to avoid her? Then Stephen towered over my dreams like a nightly impresario. Here's one he had about me. I'm at a restaurant with Kay, he writes. 
quickly join a table where Margaret Mead is sitting. Kay is like, is that Margaret Mead? She starts going on super Margaret Mead type rants. She kind of looks like Joan Didion. Wait for it. She starts talking about the last words of W.H. Auden and transphobia. Quote, nobody's more celebratory of the erotic than trans people, I said in Stephen's dream at the Margaret Mead table. Or did Margaret say it? Then I told Margaret about fucking boys' mouths on day two of affairs. Day two is kind of a Margaret day. In Stephen's write-up of the dream, that's in quotes, so either I editorialized to Margaret Mead about dedicating the second mouth-fucking day of an affair to her in quiet contemplation, like a day in the French Republican calendar dedicated to cabbage, or she inserted herself into my tawdry affairs to self-dedicate mouth-fucking to the memory of Margaret Mead and other Margarets. I thought she was a Christian socialist. I mistook her for Dorothy Day. In the dream, Stephen's holding me and spooning me. He feels deep platonic love. And then Kay is also W.H. Auden. And I'm crying because I love him so much and I can't speak. W.H. Auden is trans, like poetry is a way of happening. Patrick says I'm reanimating his interest in aesthetics and a feet kitten he'd long since drowned. Auden's last words are a kind of stuttering monologue about beauty and gratitude throughout which he gradually loses coherence. There, Steve, did I get it right? So the dream feeds itself on a waste of love and we crash on allegorically into possible contact. In August, I dreamt of Harry cycling backwards, split between three bodies like a feudal state, or Garion in hell. Actually, he had the nervous system of three bikes. He reversed slowly down the street in perfect coordination to avoid any spills or crashes and also he explained for insurance purposes. Usually, Steve and I dream you're up late or directing a play or starring in one or excoriating the deserving world from the Williamsburg Bridge. And in my favorite dream, you searched for me in a basement where I was looking for sweets. Conrad exited to tell me that I might not understand war, trading, debt, and derivatives, but I would touch them for the rest of my life. Here are some things I'd touch instead. Judy Sill in heroin ecstasy, eyes cast upward past David Geffen or Bernini, like Teresa fixed on a dispossessed god. Joe on stage in a limpress shirt, Patrick's shuddering body or, and Cam's radio purr transmitting from Treaty One territory on the far side of the griefable border. Whale spermaceti, peanut butter, snowdrifts, Mike's hands of elastic capacity, Shiv's Goliath 60 second hug, and Diana's plaintive unemotional grip put to use in someone else's sex dream. I'm gonna skip ahead a bit. I'm getting to my final stanza. I feel very much not WH Auden, so it's really funny to me. I like, I like Auden. But I don't feel identified with Auden. It's really funny to me that Stephen was like, oh, in my dream, Kay turns into Auden, who was also trans. Okay. Okay. Um, it's a bit, as you guys can tell, this, this poem could go on forever, which is kind of interesting. Okay, this is the last stanza, and then I'll close. The last stanza I have written so far. It's potentially interminable. In a university, no, wait, one second, nope. By now it's March and I dream a short, scrawny man with shaggy hair is fucking me finally on the tiled floor of the shower built into his narrow room. I felt something like relief till I looked down at the lower pieces of my manageable body where my legs had spreaded long, stiff black hairs like quills, pine needles, or antennae. I had the sense an audience of family and friends was somehow observing us from behind the shower. On waking, I supply three possible names for the scruffy lover, now faceless, as pseudonymous as, as a pamphleteer. So J or G or L saw past my wretched legs to break in his bathroom tiles in a cramped squat with running water, while I watched not my lover, but the bathroom mirror line lining the swoop and dip of his spine. I'd never had a feeling. I used to hook up with this dancer, H. He wanted to meet your trans friends at a request so regular or pretended not to have any. He persisted, I called it off, but even so I liked the idea of H lucky Pierreing himself in his mind between two of the dolls. Like in mine, I'm lucky Pierre between two H's. I double my lover, the one in back, a contractor blowing out the wall, the one in front can walk on his hands. Just once I'd like to see them feed each other. Picture the kind of video where some narrow twink gets slammed front and back and can only manage to watch himself in the webcam. From the navel down, the tops are twin contractors doing their best work on his infrastructure, or that's what it looks like from here. In a university classroom, Cam dreams he receives a book by Chris, the physicist who's eating lunch. You turned left, 
walked underneath the BQE, en route to a show that either will or won't further damage your ears. Your friends are tending bar and celebrating birthdays, but you head to the front of the room, place your hands on the shoulders of strangers, and vault over them till you're at the stage like a super fan, ready to receive gospel t-shirts, socks, or jeans from the performers. You're smelling everybody's breath. Return outside to the wet night where a group is assembled, listening to the conversations from the past. You sound more intelligent, less self-conscious than you remembered. Maybe this is okay. Your friend Cole gestures for you with a single finger and you lay on your side and watch his hair disappear as though by invisible clippers. There is dessert. No, somebody said there's dessert, but you didn't see it yourself. So Public Works delivered you to friends who abandoned you to promise bands, absent cake, strangers in the snaking expressway. Once Stephen asked if you'd ever seen the Robert Altman Popeye starring Robin Williams and Shelley Duvall, gravely you replied that not only had you seen it, but the set to this day serves as a landscape for a solid fraction of your dreams. Altman had it specially constructed on Malta. Anyone can visit. It's a popular tourist attraction known as Popeye Village. And so the Popeye were fastidious tax agents skid on wooden slats into the sea where babies gamble and Robin Williams plays both mother and father is as divergent, overwritten, and simultaneous between our mutually interrupting minds of the BQE or the rail yard in Winnipeg bisecting the North End, where in both cases, houses were bulldozed, right of way purchased, now trucks ferry produce, finished goods, lumber, livestock, and sometimes crash into passenger vehicles and nobody got out. An interruption arrives in tragedy's dull boots on the interstate. Popeye is as illegible as two symptoms pressed onto the same surface. Nobody would believe you locked it out of me. Becca dreams she's involved in an incredibly intense dom-sub dynamic scene in the middle of the combination French Revolution and a not yet capsizing Titanic, where Mel Brooks is introducing, presenting, and screening his latest feature film like a performer in a ruffled shirt from the Borscht Belt come to deliver us from Cottonmouth. Patrick dreams of Sarah Shulman chanting an original number at him. The lyrics go, I'm not a communist, but I am a pink promunist. Cam, let's be both. They're run through parallel sentences destined to meet in a chatty afterlife. Dreamscape, ship, deck, peopled with our dead. And who are they? Yes, I want to know. It's a year of wanton ship shape need. It's 2005, and the world spirit got bangs. Thanks very much. Wow. Thank you so much. Um... Okay, first of all, can you, everybody just in the privacy of your own homes, we need to know that you are standing up and going crazy for Asia Wadud and Kay Gabriel one more time. Do it. Whoa! <laughs> Ian, you made, you made more hands with which to clap. I've been working on that. Um, it's I the, love the epic poem Auden wishes he would have written. <laughs> I love how many letters are in that poem. There's at least two Ks. There is at least one H. There's a WH and there's a BQE. And there's it's it's there's a I'm I'm already um, composing a an intervention to the alphabet of K Gabriel's epic poem. <laughs> um I love the Norman Bethune poster. <laughs> That's, uh, you, you know, only Canadian leftists read poetry in front of Norman Bethune posters. Um, that was amazing. So I think we're going to now uh, bring the audience into the, well, first we should just say there's one more reading left in this segue series. No, Ian, that couldn't be possible. It doesn't seem possible okay. yet. Have you found more amazing poets? Uh, I don't know. Maybe we should check. I thought I saw that, but you're now that I'm thinking about it, you're right. That seems too good to be true. There's no way. Well, would you just double check that it's not the case just so we can let the people know at home? Hold on. Okay. I think I've said, that, I've said this at other readings in this series too. The Lucky Pierre is having like a moment in American poetry right now. It, it's this is like the, I think the third segue reading where Lucky Pierres have been of topic. I just read in the Times, Ian. Uh, Galena Rimbu and Wendy Trevino are reading next week. Can you believe that? Not not at the same reading. Come on. At the segue reading series that we will be introducing. 
that sounds incredible. I'm going to show up in Zoom at 5 p.m. Eastern time next Saturday to be at that reading virtually. Me too. Fantastic. Fantastic.